Thank you. Apologies for being late. Um, okay, so where did this um, idea originally come from? Um, around about 2005, we were asked by um, our client, uh, who had the sort of vaulting ambition of demolishing this end of um, terrace, which is just there on Hyde Park, Bayswater Road on one side, Inverness Terrace on the other, and creating a mansion block that faces the park. And actually, if you wander along that side of the park, that's probably one of the few remaining blocks, the end of an urban block, that you can do that too. Um, how do you start with a site like that, with, um, with um, uh, such potential on it? I think if we had, if we were one of those officers that had sort of motivational uh, strap lines that you come in and read before you start work, it might say something like um, explore, restore, and ignore. And explore really is about where do you start with any project? Do you start with um, the particular interests you have at the time? Um, the sort of research that you're doing that you effectively um, repeat across a number of projects, a number of design um, ideas, and develop over a time. Perhaps um, the equivalent of stretching a PhD across um, four or five projects. Do you start every project from scratch, um, afresh? Well, it's sort of impossible, but you could, you could try that. To some, in some respects, certainly some local context can influence the, um, the um, be a seed to, the, to, the, to that idea, um, even if you pull in other, other um, whether they're technologies or other theories you might have. Sometimes they're stronger, sometimes they're not. On this occasion, uh, we found uh, that most of the buildings in that Bayswater area are pretty much stucco, so speculative, brick-built, stucco, Victorian buildings, uh, uh, townhouses for sort of the middle classes of that time. Apart from this one, which is a really finely cut stone, very, very rare for that area. Uh, they're mostly on the other side of the park, uh, just because there's a wealthier distribution across the park. A little bit of history on that. We, we then investigated why this building existed on this site, and why, it was, why such money was spent on it. And you might recognize this chap and, and her. This is um, Albert, who was the eldest son of Queen Victoria. And while he was Prince of Wales, waiting to, to, um, to, um, to be crowned, as it were, he, he, he was a playboy, effectively. And one of his mistresses was Lily Langtry, who he built this for. Uh, now, if you, I would recommend going to see this building. I mean, the rest of it internally has been totally messed about with, so no, nothing left apart from the ground floor. And in the rear of the ground floor, you'll see a tiny little uh, proscenium arch theatre in which he used to go and sit with some friends and she would perform and he'd spend the rest of the, day, uh, rest of the weekend having parties with them. Now, I, uh, most of you and I never heard of architects called Muse Davis, who were the fosters of their period. They pretty much swallowed up all large commercial work in, in London. So I think they did the RAC Club, the Ritz-Carlton, etc., all across, um, all across the center, cent central, um, central London at the time. Typically of that period, what you'll see is um, bays, so you might see that as a single bay that's repeated vertically and then just um, repeated horizontally as well. Here, because it's such a small <coughs> plot, you'll see the sort of end pavilion treatments quite across that short distance, as it were. Now, we imagined if you look at the Ritz-Carlton and uh, um, RSC Club and others, effectively what they do is pretty much repeat that bay vertically across the entire um, elevation. And then in typical sort of neoclassical manner, there's an end pavilion, there might be a central pavilion as well, and some modulation in the roof heights. All, uh, almost all um, uh, speculative um, apartment buildings follow a sort of international code of one bedroom, two bedrooms, ensuite bathrooms, all the rest of it, until they get to the sort of four bedroom and larger. Once you decide to, um, once you've laid out that puzzle, as it were, because really, once you follow that code, it's really a sort of puzzle that you cobble together across a plan, uh, make that work according to other criteria, in this case, directly south and various GLA requirements. 
how do you treat that? Well, you know, all of us would treat that in, in, in any particular way we wish. And, you know, you know, it's, all of them are legitimate. Here we experimented with the idea that that, um, that, um, that Muse Davis had originally intended for that, for, um, for that building on Inverness Terrace to actually wrap around the entire block and come back again. So it's, a, it's an entirely sort of fictional narrative. It's a sort of false uh, memory, um, which uh, sort of led us to the idea that why don't we just invent these memories? Why, why don't we misremember some of these? Um, in the same way that perhaps you might misremember particular, um, well, rather neoclassical details in general, especially by the Victorians, are deliberately mis misremembered. They're not, they don't follow any real proportion because they're really slightly more expedient than, say, the Georgian, Georgian um, um, uh, interpretation of the neoclassical. Once we made that decision, what is that form? What's it made of? Um, the, the idea of this um, uh, a memory um, as a monument, uh, so uh, if, if there's any Germans among you, you'll probably know that over here we just call it a monument. In German, it's called a Denkmal, which um, a direct translation, if my German is any good, is, um, is it think about it? Is that the best direct translation? Think of, of it, think, um, you think, I guess. Is that the best translation? Maybe, someone sort of, yeah. Uh, which I think is a great, uh, great um, direct understanding of monuments. Um, so we started with the idea that it's a cast, it's a cast, it's a, it's a bronze cast of a monument that really um, represents a memory that really never was. And that memory that never was should therefore be slightly ephemeral. And that's sort of tied in with the idea that this thing is a, is a sort of ghost that wraps an otherwise um, um, commercial envelope. Um, that's really, I'll just take you through that project very quickly. Holding that idea then, we came, we were asked to, um, we submitted that for, for planning with Westminster. Um, our client had um, told me right at the beginning, I put my shirt on this I mean, so we must get planning for this, otherwise I'll lose everything. And I don't, I don't know if you know, um, I think it's Robert Davis was the, uh, the head of planning, not head of planning, but he's the councillor in charge. He's like a pharaoh, so once you sit in front of him, if he, if he gives a thumbs up, um, it goes through. If he gives a thumbs down, it doesn't. He gave the thumbs down, and um, we had to be re replaced by Michael Squires, who I think eventually might have got the approval through. In any case, holding that idea, about a few, few months later, we were invited on a competition for this site in, in, um, in, on Upper Street. Over here is a furniture company called Aria uh, who bought this site and held a competition of about five, six architects. All of us, I think we had about three weeks to come up with a scheme, come up with a sketch proposal. Um, we did some research into what had already been on the site, so um, it was clearly it was a building on the site. It was bombed during the war uh, and nothing had, nothing had replaced it since. If you look at that, again, Really, it's, those are party walls. That's really a, a, a normal parade of shop fronts with accommodation for the shop owners below. Some, some point in the Victorian period, somebody decided actually, unlike the rest of the street either side, I'll take this end block and turn it into something that's sort of semi-palladium. So you've got a central piece. You could call those wings. And that treatment there is the sort of pavilions at the end. Again, as I said earlier on, it really isn't anything to do with neoclassical architecture apart from some of the very um, cursory detailing. Inevitably, you ask five or six architects, they're all going to apply their, their um, uh, if you like, their, um, their typical languages across it. Um, we, uh, having come fresh from the Bayswater scheme, and being disappointed, we thought we'd apply, the, apply our, our idea here. So our first approach was exactly the same solution on this site, that sort of uh, memory or misremembered solution, um, which sort of picked up on the idea that the Victorians are deliberately mis misremembering the neoclassical. 
the danger of presenting, anytime you go to a planning app, uh, submit a planning application and sum, uh, submit your des what's called design access statement, you'll all eventually come across that if you haven't already through your year out. Uh, the danger of submitting anything where you show precedence, so we showed the precedence of obviously Rachel Whiteread and Do Hu So, I don't know if you know the Kore um, Korean artist, as well as Edward Francois and Dina and Dina. The danger of precedence is that people will often look at what you're proposing. Well, that, has that ever been done before? I'm a bit worried about that, but I can definitely see somebody else has done the other one in terracotta or concrete. Uh, so the danger there is that you en end up being pushed to something that you don't necessarily initially envisage you want to do. At this, at this point, we were encouraged to drop the bronze altogether and go for, um, for a, um, a faience solution, which is terracotta. Principally, the problem with terracotta and faience is that you really need a superstructure on which you hang that product. That superstructure has already got um, um, an inherent sort of difference anyway, as well as a cost implication. And you're really just hanging stuff on, on, on the outside of something and then putting a, an internal finish beyond that superstructure. We were keen that this uh, form is um, architectonic in the sense that it is a casting of, of something that was there before. It's this memory. But actually, it performs structurally at the same time. And then ultimately displays the way we might make things today very differently from, say, traditionally hanging faience. So we pursued, um, pursued that idea. But generally here, in terms of its design form, you can see there it's really just a mirror of that end pavilion. Uh, so very early on, we, we decided, okay, if it's a casting, if, the, if it's this solid or rather hollow cast um, form of the building that was there before, outside and inside, so all those windows, the older windows, um, are, are mirrored internally with their sashes, uh, their surrounds. Why not also um, cast in the dado rails, the cornices, um, etc., skirting boards? Uh, leave those in, but actually bring our new accommodation in a wholly different material. So effectively, you're walking into this shell. So imagine you're walking into this ruined um, the shell of a ruined castle, but you're inhabiting it. And that, that our new inhabitation has absolutely nothing to do with the alignment of the old. It's a different material, obviously. And then where you want to inhabit, you then punch a window rather rudely through, through the old form, as it were, through that monument. In terms of its plan, similarly, there aren't any uh, petitions that follow the old, uh, the old um, uh, room pattern. What you, what, you, what you get instead is just one large open floor plan uh, and these uh, wardrobes furniture pieces which have integrated doors, sliding, pivoting, etc., that then just shut off rooms around them. So this, for instance, you might put a bed there, you might put a study room in there, um, you might put a small office space in there, but obviously we've shown that this is, this is how it might be laid out if it's be um, uh, bedrooms and living spaces. In terms of its construction, that then is our shell, yeah? so that's our monument, as it were, which is effectively just a, a, a solid concrete wall with insulation dropped in the middle of it, all cast at the same time. I think there's sort of 1.6 one meter um, um, bands. I'll let Jason explain that in a second. Um, and then here's our new structure, our new inhabitation that comes in is sort of pinned into it. I should let you take over here, Jason, because you're going to be... Um, Oh yeah, okay. If, yeah. Uh, you mean two lines as in what's on the outside and <laughs> all right. So I guess most of you, you know, all of us when we first start in our first year and onwards and even in our careers, um, our starting point is a, a pen, piece of CAD drawing with its infinitely thin line nowadays, but let's take our pencil and we begin to sketch out our, our ideas, whether in plan or elevation or in section. Inevitably, what we end up drawing, oops, where's our laser? What we end up drawing is really a black line that might represent the outside of your building. 
a black line that might re represent a window opening. Um, we might even do internal sketches with atmosphere and shadows um, and light pouring through windows. Ultimately, those are also lines that represent the interior. Trouble I always have is that, um, and this is just experience, personal experience, working in offices and then eventually in our own. Um, it's very easy to do, and inevitably, that's almost what we're mistrained to do. So I don't know. You can turn around to your tutors here and blame them, uh, as I blame some of mine. Um, because we're not really told anything about the stuff in the middle, are we? We're always told, because um, you have to get that right to start off with, the physics of the, of the, of, uh, of the interior spaces and the relationship with the hierarchy of those spaces. But very rarely are we told about this stuff in the middle. So we, we don't treat it with a great deal of importance. We might get to, I don't know, a few mil beyond that line once we decide, is it brick? Is it Corten steel? Is it whatever? Ultimately then, the design team will then decide, where is your structure? Is there a steel column? Is there a concrete column in there? Is it actually in there? Is this, is this material hung off it? So the point that Jason's asking me to make is that if we try and think of what that material is from the outset, so if our concept, this memory for instance, if that's our initial driving concept, if we think from the outset what, if there's a material that somehow chimes with that or integrates with that, um, uh, with that initial concept, so for instance the original one was brass because monuments tend to be cast in brass, sorry, bronze, then we know from the outset what that material is. Technically, then, how do you make that building out of bronze? Do you make it as a superstructure that holds up all floor plates, or is it something that's actually suspended off the superstructure? In this case, it was the decision then to go for something that's monolithic as a material, uh, in, so concrete, that then drove, that drove the material, the structure, and then how that material is actually put together, because the, the idea of representing uh, an older form, how we might make it today, how we might think about it, and how we would make it, can then be translated in literally how, how it's represented as you walk past it, how you see it. So, um, is that a good time to, um, will you, will you, you know, do you know how to pick up from that? Um, <laughs> yeah, I think so. I'll just jump in if you miss the okay. spot. So this is the pointer. Oh. Okay, so I guess what you're talking about with the two lines concept is not just draw on the inside and the outside of the building, but really think about what happens in the middle. And I think kind of one of the initial reactions from the consultants in the line, looking at the previous examples of Edward Francois, for instance, was to go for a precast concrete panel system, which doesn't mean said you might have a uh, structure on the inside, which then would then have to be lined with plasterboard or other materials and really what we try to do as a practice is take it back to the start and think how can we achieve a finish which is cost effective um, which we thought being in situ was um, being cast was slightly more suitable to, to a monument. Um, and I guess really from where I was involved in the project was taking it forward from this stage. We have the concept of this uh, memory, this misremembered building. How do we, um, how do we drive it forward? So um, initially what we did at the start of the project is working with contractors right at the start. So this guy here is the main contractor from Tolina Builders. Um, right in the early stages of um, the tender development, um, we constructed a number of sample panels which helped us to build trust with the contractor that the scheme could be buildable. There's lots of contractors we spoke to who would either run a mile or want to kind of charge us two, three times more what the client was actually willing to pay. Um, so bringing him on, on board at a very early stage was important. Um, we developed a number of um, kind of formwork samples. So what we have is a um, expanded, or extruded polystyrene, which is then routed with a CNC machine. Um, so we built a model in Rhino, send that off to the CNC producers. They then produce the formwork. And we went through a series of samples on site with both the contractor and the planning authority. Um, so as I mentioned, that helped us to kind of bring down the cost and define the cost with the contractor. But it was also a crucial part of the planning process. 
I think in the end it took around like eight to ten months to um, get planning approval. So it took ten samples altogether. Um, this is the first one, which was um, kind of made by a, a different contractor to who actually built the project in the end. Um, and there you can see it's actually quite it's quite crisp compared to some of the other earlier versions. Um, but there's a lot of slippages in between the polystyrene joints, and we wasn't particularly happy with the colour. Um, and then through the other eight and nine samples, we then tested different textures, colours, the resolution. Do we need these joints to be a little bit crisper and sharper? Um, kind of. But ultimately, that was also about how do we how do we find a kind of economical process of achieving the finish. Um, something we've had on a number of projects in the office where we've worked with concrete is um, I think one private house in particular where there's a, there's a very light white concrete and the client is very keen on having a kind of almost perfect finish where they're looking at it from this far away and kind of noticing any blemishes which had to be um, corrected. But we understand what um, concrete is, what it wants to be, how imperfections kind of are natural and inherent within the construction process. So part of this testing allowed us to explore those inaccuracies um, and kind of understand a little bit more about how the building would be um, built. So this is the building at the other end of the terrace. This is 157 Upper Street. Um, and what we did is took a 3D laser scan of this building. Um, it's almost exactly the same except for the roof. You'll notice the windows are slightly different down here. These are kind of slightly newer um, additions. Um, you'll see the windows on the actual building are kind of what we've traced back to the historical photographs. A slightly more um, accurate version. So this is um, an example of the, the point cloud laser survey, which is li a literal translation of this piece at the top here. Um, this was, um, I think they took three or four points around the site, fired a huge kind of amount of lasers through it and picked up an incredible amount of detail. I think you could even, like the lasers even went through some of the windows of the neighbouring properties and you could see people standing in there at the windows. But um, yeah, part of the process of um, building this is taking this point cloud survey, turning it into a Rhino model. Um, so this is all the formwork for the upper street and Barnsley street elevations. Um, each band is approximately 1.2 metres high. So from the top, bottom to the top of the building, is around 16 bands in total. Um, you'll see in a moment those bands are kind of red on the outside, but essentially the builder on site would build the polystyrene on the outside, cast the concrete in it, whilst that's curing, then build the next band of polystyrene and continue the way up. <coughs> this <coughs> is a photograph of the CLT superstructure. So as I mean, kind of talked you through before, you have the external in situ terracotta facade, which is then tied into the CLT floor plates. This was erected in about, I think, eight days on site. So you have a temporary glue lamb structure here, which is then supporting the floor plates, which are also toothed into the, the part of wall here. So these items, or these um, little bits of teeth coming out of the CLT, there's holes in the uh, party wall there ready to take them. I guess really the process from then was, as I just mentioned, building up the polystyrene on the outside. You have the, the gap where the concrete would be poured on the outside, a layer of insulation, more concrete on the inside, and then you'd have all the wallpaper cast internally. So this is um, one of the column capitals around first floor level. You can see the um, 3D laser survey and the polystyrene is almost kind of perfectly kind of moulded to go around the existing um, column. And then we have the process of um, scraping out the polystyrene, slowly um, kind of hacking it out with a um, crowbar, as you can see, um, after which we gently um, sandblasted it to reveal the aggregate slightly. Is a, is a much quicker process of clean it, but also um, kind of dulled the colour slightly and gave it a little bit more of a kind of uneven and ghostly texture. And yeah, this is, um, this is then a um, photograph of the outside. You can see the slight subtle difference in the window compared to the um, slightly more recent additions.
And then on the outside, you can see the kind of horizontal 1.2 meter polystyrene lines. <coughs> and I guess, um, and a part of what you were talking about before, I mean, and the, the idea of the building or the concept of building not being just a memory, but it's rather misremembered. So um, rather than an exact replica, rather than an exact copy, how do certain imperfections come through the kind of narrative of the building? through the, the way that the details are um, scanned on the laser survey, through the way that they're then translated into a CAD model, and the way that they're then translated into the formwork and on site. So you have certain parts of formwork which have slipped. There's a bit of the building here, which is just out of shot, but that has slipped and kind of been replaced with this element down here. The certain capital details you'll see here, and there's a more detailed photo in a moment, where um, through the CNC process, that detail has been slightly distorted and disfigured. Um, what that's really doing is kind of celebrating the, the process of, of making the building, but also showing traces of how the building's been made. It's a representation of this um, fictional building, but in a slightly more um, contemporary construction manner. And this is a view from down the street. <laughs> Can you explain a bit more about Pushpas? Uh, well, not really. <laughs> I think if you, um, we had a. Uh, so, generally, yeah, if you go to the next one, I mean, generally we were worried that it would come out too perfect. Mm. Um, normally, contractors are worried that architects are asking for perfection, as Jason was just saying. that. We've done previous buildings in concrete where clients are keen on the idea of what's called fair face concrete being absolutely perfect. Well, it's a material that doesn't want to be perfect. Inevitably, what happens is the contractors put a contingency in that architects and clients will wander around and say, there's a floor here, can you repair it? And there are dedicated teams flying around there. I think there's only about two or three of them that now fly around the planet looking after the star architects' fair face concrete buildings hiding what they're doing, but really all they're doing is scraping away where the concrete has done its natural thing. Uh, architects and clients think is a failure, and they'll be filling it and painting it to make it look like concrete. When it really, all, it's concrete already, but it's not perfect, not how we imagine it should be perfect. We're quite keen on the idea that this is, it's allowed to fail. So we were asking the contractor, please don't make your alignment or formwork mm. so perfect that that perfection will inevitably fail but not fail enough. You need to show how you've made it. So we were quite keen on this. The contractor was determined to try and repair it, so we had to hold him back. Um, and then, yes, obviously the process, as Jason was saying, the process of the, the scan, the scan to the 3D model in Jason's hand. Mm. Will Jason get it right? Well, he's bound, you know, he's human, he's bound to make mistakes, so software's going to make, make mistakes. Software inevitably will make mistakes between it and the routing machine. The routing machine are, uh, are uh, bringing, uh, bringing the polystyrene on site and the casting within that polystyrene mm -hmm. and even the guys on site getting the polystyrene upside down or in the wrong place. All those things are about the making of something and why not allow it to um, speak in the building. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, uh, these, these are pictures of um, well, you know, what we Show normally... Show the inaccuracies. <laughs> Yes, exactly. well, we might call failures, mm -hmm. but we might have called failures in the past, but you know, here you've got literally the, um, the head of the routing tool that clearly would not exist in any other time. Um, but yeah, fine, so let it, let it represent how we, we do things today, or you know, for this mm. building anyway. You can see there a total mess where the, the CAD file got totally muddled by the routing machine. Mm. I just couldn't get it, couldn't understand it. And then the darts are missed out on the column. Right? So the darts are missed out on the column. Oh head yeah. down. The egg and dart, we've just got egg, haven't we? Mm. So I don't know if anybody you know your neoclassical symbolism, but the egg and dart is, that's the, um, the dart is death, isn't it? And the egg is life, but there's no death in there. Right, so that's, and then that's the interior. So we then have our timber interior, your habitable space, and the memory. So these are, I think probably, yeah, those are the window lines, so that must be the skirting. A 
and it's not too difficult to add other details. So here's some Victorian anaglypta wallpaper that's pasted onto the formwork, and the concrete actually punches that out quite cleanly. I think that's it. Yeah, I just want to go back to some of the other no. images. <laughs> Finito. <laughs> I'd love some difficult questions. <laughs> Easy questions if you, if you want. <laughs> you, you look like you've got one. Far away. The final form, you left the kind of reddish appearance on the inside as well. Yeah, yeah. So it's all the way through. Yeah. Okay, that's an easy one. <laughs> it looks like this um, cast replica, and, and as we're talking about the details, you get up close and you start to realize all these different inconsistencies. And I think one nice thing, contrast from the inside, is that it's. Uh, well, the outside is slightly kind of aged and worn, so on the inside it's slightly brighter. The, the walls are sandblasted, so you start to really see like all the um, different textures in concrete. Some parts you get the kind of concrete film on there, where other parts the aggregate shown. So it's um, it's the same on the inside, but a very different kind of textual quality. That one was next. Oh, sorry. We found out in our first um, sample, series of sample panels, we didn't put enough what's called a release agent. So normally on any formwork you put a release agent, takes the formwork up quite cleanly. First ones, it was incredibly difficult, so you just have to be careful when you apply the release agent. Put enough on them, basically. Yeah. Go on, I think you were next. So, um, why did you choose to use timber for your local expression? Uh, well, the, the tim remember the timber, all it's doing is supporting the floor slabs itself. It's not actually load bearing. The, um, yeah, if you go back, there was a bit, I mean, we normally we try and talk to all the suppliers, subcontractors in advance so we know, know what we're doing. It's all deliverable because um, the classic thing is we, come up, we all come up with fantastic ideas and then our quantity surveyor friends um, wreck it all. And our original concept is just um, a weak representation. So we try and talk to those suppliers in advance. We, got, we managed to get a cost out of them. We failed to ask them, um, what's the best way of putting it together? We somehow imagined, because the concrete contractor also imagined that you, you bring up the entire concrete shell, and then you bring your um, CLT floor slabs in, potentially every time you hit a floor plate, or bring them in bring them in afterwards. And then as we were sitting there with our, um, doing the program, scratching our heads with the CLT guy, saying, what, you're, you're going to bring your, um, you're going to ask me to come to site every, I don't know how, often, every oh, month or it's something? It's over about, over nine months or so. So yeah, if you divide that by nine months, the height, you want me to keep coming back and putting a floor plate in? I want to put the whole lot up in one go, and I can do that in seven, eight days. My God, it's a miracle. Are you sure about that? And he did. He put it up in seven, eight days. And he said, for no extra cost, I will, um, I'll do that with temporary, um, oops, there we go, with temporary structure. And we said, okay, the temporary structure needs to be far away enough from the concrete for us to do the con um, pour the concrete either side, work around it. So they, um, they basically put up the, the floor slabs suspended on temporary structure their own for an extra cost. And of course, we saw that afterwards. But wow, that's quite a nice building, huh? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's quite, uh, we're, we're going <coughs> Yeah, well, I think we'll pinch that. And um, <laughs> if you brought that to the outside, you wouldn't need any concrete, would you? <laughs> Certainly on another, another site, we'll do that. So Absolutely. Uh, no, no. Well, it's a shell. It's um, it's uh, it's um. This microphone's not loud enough, is it? Uh, okay, so you see that? That is just a solid shell that goes all the way around. Yeah, and I think uh, there you go. In section as well, all the way and all the way across. So really, the, the, these floor slabs are um, which way around? 
uh, that way. They're, they're, um, those CLT floor slabs, that is cast into the concrete, and then the floor slab just rests against that. So remember, the floor slab's are already in position. Yeah. And they've been, at the other end, they've been toothed into the party wall. So they're just suspended, and the concrete is coming up. So that thing there is actually drilled into, into the, into the, into the um, CLT, and then the concrete is just cast around it, and then it keeps going up. It's never been done before. Uh, no, no, and, and uh, that's the qu you see that's the, that's the scary thing about you see that reminds me of um, Robert Davis with our bronze one in Bayswater. He said it's never been done before. Has it? I mean, is it in, is it innovative? And normally when you speak to English heritage, they want innovation in a conservation area. So I said yes. He said, well, I don't like innovation on my patch. Mm. Eighty percent of innovations fail. Did you know that? I could see my client sort of feeling his neck and collar. Um, yeah, far away. Yes, good, it's a very, it's a very good question. Um, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Well, it wouldn't be. Oops. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. So, no, no, you're quite right. I always have that same question. So, if everybody looks very carefully. Do you, see, do you see the way the bricks are laid there? There's a long one, a short one, a long one, a short one, the same across there. Yeah? OK, so well, yeah, go, on, you, go on, you ask a question. Oh, more technical. In terms of carbon footprint, building the whole thing out of concrete, would that have more or less of an impact? Well, than that. Not that, that. Or the CLT. If we made it all out of CLT, for instance, yeah? No, so you, just, you, just, you, you didn't have the patience to wait for this man's question to be answered. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you were asking something that was related to that question. I will answer your question, and if I can remember what his question was, I'll come back to that as well, yeah? But it's a very good question. Okay, so CLT, it, uh, all of you should think of CLTs uh, as a, because we, we're, we've done a number of CLT buildings now, and the revelation really is that CLT is the accidental by, well, you could treat it almost as the accidental byproduct of these forests, which are really carbon capture factories, yeah? So CLT will typically bring your carbon footprint down by 75% against conventional superstructure. So the CLT there is a superstructure, so a steel frame, a concrete frame. All its um, uh, block work, um, floor to floor, within the floor plates, its wind posts, all the stuff that normally holds up the building before you put your windows in the finishes and the external finish, CLT will bring that down by 75%. So that's quite dramatic and really, you know, as soon as you hear that, you think, oh, well, why the hell aren't we building everything in CLT? Well, about 10 years ago, maybe, I can't remember how long ago that, um, so 1997, wasn't it, the Labour came into government, uh, they created this thing called Building Schools for the Future and a lot of architects were using CLT for building schools for the future and at that time we only had urban and KLH as suppliers in this country. They pretty much swallowed up. Um, building Schools for the Future swallowed up all CLT. We managed, because, it was, uh, because they swallowed it up, and, and it's a government project and typical bureaucratic projects, price per, per square meter just goes up and they keep spending anyway. Because it's a political, it's a it's policy now, yeah? It's government policy. So you find Building Schools for the Future are actually costing the same as luxury private housing. Uh, but anyway, that's another subject altogether. We actually built a private house, uh, an estate, a private estate, where the outbuildings, the sort of um, crude, rough gatehouse, the coach house, the, the boathouse, are all CLT. So we could afford to do it then. So we experimented with it then. Now CLT, because there's no more building schools for the future, has come down to the cost it always was originally in Middle Europe and Northern Europe. So it's fairly cheap to build. It's very quick. So um, this is just a slightly boring CLT answer, so bear with me. Um, I'm not selling CLT, but I'm just telling you the facts. Um, if you, if you, typical building in CLT will go up in eight days. So one of our other projects also in CLT was an apartment building, went up, also went up in eight days, instead of, say, six months for the superstructure and everything else. Now that cost maybe, I think, 140 kilos in carbon while it was being erected on site while the other one would have cost six tons in carbon while it was erect being erected on site. So materially, the time you're on site, it reduces carbon footprint by, by 75%. Yeah. 
Okay. That doesn't answer your question <laughs> about this one, though, does it? <laughs> Why the hell did we do it in concrete? Well, we're not, we're not, um, not every building um, in your portfolio of buildings um, uh, can be CLT or concrete, this sort of concrete. So some, 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 uh, some briefs will require different solutions. So this one is uh, uh, a sensitive site in the conservation area that required, uh, if you like, a, an expensive carbon and expensive in money terms <coughs> solution. Yeah. There was another question which was, why the hell didn't we do it in brick? Okay, so here's, here's your brick bond. That's called either English garden wall bond or Flemish bond. And you see long, short, long, short. Now, all that's telling you is that you've got a brick that way and a brick that way. And that's the first clue that the brick layers are laying their bricks at 90 degrees because they're actually toothing in a series of bricks that make what's called a load-bearing wall. So that brick wall is holding up all the floor plates internally. But it's a solid brick wall. It's got no cavity, no insulation. So all the heat and warmth goes straight out of it. It's using lime mortar, not cement mortar. And you can only lay a load-bearing brick wall uh, with lime mortar up to five courses before you have to wait for it to dry. If you do any more courses, the lime's not going off fast enough, and the courses above are beginning to squeeze the lime mortar out. So your brickies have to leave and go and do some work elsewhere, and then come back until it goes off. So there's fundamental economic reasons you don't build standard um, projects in load-bearing brick. If clients are willing to pay for it, they've got the patience, program, etc., and money, then you can do it. But then you still need your environmental criteria. So you do a cavity wall. Well, okay, so you do a cavity wall from the outside in, you're beginning to lose internal area. Well, a client can put up with that, that's okay. You might then not meet your space standards. Well, that's fundamentally knocks that scheme on the head. Let's say you still meet your space standards. Will you actually ever achieve exactly the same details? It's highly unlikely, which is the whole point of what we're doing. At that time, the Victorians developed um, uh, uh, um, uh, a sort of, um, um, I don't know, what do you call it, end-to-end uh, -end production that made stone carving <laughs> fairly inexpensive, fast. These are all elements that are used on other buildings. So they're all a kit of parts that you put together that you can deploy on this. It doesn't make a great deal of sense economically, environmentally, um, financially, uh, uh, space-wise, etc., to build exactly like that. You won't achieve anything exactly like that. You can try very hard, but you'll never, it'll never appear like that. Um, but, I mean, ultimately, why would you? Why would you try that hard? Does that answer your question? That was your question, wasn't it? Yeah. No? no? Yeah. Okay, well, be more specific in your question, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. You can reproduce that, make it environmentally, structurally good as it was. Yeah. We can do that. You know that we can. Well, if you. I don't well, I don't know. If you. If you if you're you can make Flemish brickwork. Oh, you can do it. But it will take a lot longer well, and... You did, guys. You, yeah. did, you radicalized the technology. You did something radical with, with construction technology. Uh, all right. I, I, I will... I, oh, yeah. I, I certainly will hold my... So I, I won't rationalize it in, in... Exactly. Yeah, yeah. We certainly did it because we wanted to do it. Yeah. 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 I've, I've seen plenty of architects nowadays are doing that. Some of them say, I've got an end of terrorist thing. What do you want to do? Yeah. I'll build that. Yeah. Literally that. Yeah, yeah. They'll yeah. do it. Of course yeah. they'll do yeah. it. Yeah. They'll insulate it. They'll, yeah. they'll pass the part L. Yeah. They'll pass all the building regs and they'll make it. It looks terrible. It doesn't and actually it look. look yeah, well, yeah. it looks like it, like that. Yeah. Well, you did was very different to yeah. that. And that's what I've oh. worked for. We, as, yeah. you know, thank you for the, yeah. you know, the technology is, yeah. you, you had to invent it. Yeah, absolutely. You had to invent a new mm. technology in order to do it. Yeah. That's yeah. what. Well, yeah, Jason, Jason's very shy about, about telling you that um, hmm. the thing you have to remember as an architect once you graduate is that you're meant to be the, what traditionally we used to call the team leader, the design team leader. So you sit around the table and you're meant to have the quantity surveyor, the structural engineer, environmental, all the rest of them around the table 
and lead them. Yeah. Um, and the idea of all those people around the table isn't that you take it all in turns to just pile in your solution and that's the end of it. You're all meant to be not necessarily talking at the same time, but certainly listening. And while you're listening, one of them, like the, nowadays we have what's called independent approved inspectors for building regs, will suddenly scratch his head and say, oh, I wondered why the hell I was meant to be here. Actually, you can do this in the following way and wipe out potentially the QS is sitting there thinking, oh my God, that's wiped out 15% of the budget. Oh, great, you know, we made a 15% saving. The whole point is that you lead by, um, by allowing everybody to speak and get their input in. And, uh, and as design team leader, you're essentially also driving the architecture at the same time. Right from the outset, our structural engineer thought they were the design team leader. So um, they immediately on the, second, on the second meeting with our client, uh, had done all their homework and said, yes, yes, here it is, precast concrete panels, it's going to cost a fortune, uh, steel frame, um, client is screaming and shouting, oh my God, what have you done to me? And we're all going to go bust, you've ruined me. And I'm looking at, looking at the structural engineer saying, well, what the hell have you done to us? Yeah. Um, so Jason and I sat down, and Jason did quite a lot of hard work, taking the quantity surveyors manual. So remember, quantity surveyors also go to university and they graduate and they graduate with this, um, the book, the cost book. The cost book literally divides the building into elements, superstructure, external finish, internal finish. Well, already there in those three chapters, you've separated the potential mm -hmm. for external finish, superstructure, internal finish to be one. Well, we demonstrated that doing that in all, all as one is a huge cost saving. However, the quantity surveyor took maybe three iterations of those meetings with the client for the quantity surveyor to continually tell us there's still an external finish to do. Because, yeah, I, I can see your price for superstructure. What about the external finish? Hey, here's the external finish. What about the internal finish? I've got plasterboard everywhere. Where is it? There is no plasterboard. <coughs> three meetings later, he finally, the light bulb went off. And, uh, uh, you know, he had to demonstrate uh, by going to uh, suppliers of expanded polystyrene routing um, uh, companies, uh, concrete companies, um, all of those gave pound per square meter rates. and We applied those and just delivered mm. those. You're, you're effectively doing what we used to do as a profession. You're being the quantity surveyor as well as the leader. Otherwise, mm. we wouldn't have got that. We would have um, ended up with uh, a scheme that was unbuildable and this client would have had to go back to planning and you know, you'd see something else on the site. Mm. Yeah, I think the, the precast option was probably almost double the price. Yeah. Was, and uh, in this instance, well, the precast option, you would have to build a frame, then put the panels on the outside, where here it's all entirely one product. You don't even, you don't even go that far. The problem with the mm. precast is that you do one, one panel, normally of stainless steel, that needs to do ten, at least 10 moulds before it becomes redundant. But you've got so many special panels here. You're effectively cladding the build, building in stainless steel, taking the stainless steel away, because you only do maybe one mold. So it's a whole, yeah, it's just a non-starter as, as a solution. These are mm. slightly, they sound a bit, um, um, what, um, prosaic, but they're fundamental to you executing your, um, your concept, as it were, I'm afraid.